Our first speaker is Alan Bolio, and many of you probably heard him when he was back here before with uh, the Council of Economic Advisors speaking here. He's president for the Institute for Trend Research, active member of the Investment Committee. He's co-author of Make Your Move, a book on how to increase profits through business cycle changes. He's also senior economic advisor to the National Association of Wholesaler Distributors and the Heating and Refrigeration Distributor International. He's been in workshops, providing seminars throughout the United States for about the last 20 years. And he's one of the consulting with the companies who have a domestic and global perspective on how to forecast. You can read about him in the Wall Street Journal. He's been in uh, most of the radio and television programs, Sirius Talk Radio, CNN, CNBC, you name it. So with great pleasure, Alan is going to be coming up and talking to you about his perspective on the market in the economy. Thank you, Julie. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Everybody in a good mood? Okay, that's good, because I'm going to take you right down now. We're going to get... <laughs> so it's good to start at a good level. Uh, let me give you the basic thrust, and then I want to give you some quick disclaimers, and then we'll go on. The basic thrust is that the U.S., just despite my colleagues' comments, isn't a sustainable recovery. This is a real recovery. It will last through 2011, and it, in our opinion, last through 2012. That the economy of the state, the city, the country will be expanding. No, it's not going to expand at the same pace, but it is expanding, and life will get better for people as we go forward. So I thought you'd like to know that up front. Uh, that's the basic outlook. But that's not to say that we don't have problems. And I'm going to discuss some of those problems because you and I are going to have to run our businesses differently in the next 20 years than we did in the last 20 years. And I want to highlight a couple of those things. And the disclaimer that I want to give you is pretty simple. I'm not here to make anybody a Democrat, and I'm not here to make anybody a Republican. That's not my job. Uh, I'm actually an equal, equal opportunity slanderer. We're going to walk right down the middle of that road. But we have to talk about some economic policies and the impact that we're going to feel. So uh, let's get started. The, the world is getting better. When we look at the U.S. economy, the yellow line is GDP. The blue line is industrial production. You can't help but realize that life is getting better in our country. That white line across the middle is 0% growth. The scale shows you 5% growth, 10% growth, and then negative growth below the zero line. How can you not feel better about what's going on around us when you see that the economy is expanding? And in, I don't want to get into pointed arguments with people, but a recovery is when you're heading back up towards the peak, and the United States economy is heading back in the right direction. It won't be a straight line. We have some problems coming. Those trend lines that you see are going to start moving downward in the immediate future. That blue line has already started to come down. GDP is going to cool off, and we're going to see a slower rate of growth next year, but we're going to stay above that zero line as we go forward. And real quickly, just notice with me that recessions are a normal event of life. You can see that when, the, when the, you see those peaks uh, inverted, when you see things going below year ago levels in industrial production and in GDP, they happen regularly. There's no reason to be surprised. There's no reason to, to think that this was some sort of one-off event. Media and politicians always treat it like, where did that come from? There's always one coming. And there's another one coming. They occur about every 7 to 11 years, by the way. So if you do your math, it's not hard. Somewhere towards the end of this decade, there's another recession coming, and it will be fairly significant in scope. So how's lunch? Lunch good? OK. So I want to make sure. I'm going to be showing you a few graphs. And, and on those graphs, you're going to see 12, 12 rate of change. I just wanted to explain the terminology. Take monthly data. And it's very noisy. So you smooth it out with a 12-month moving total. That's great. You know where you are. When you want to see where you're going, you go to the 12-12 rate of change, which takes the last 12-month moving total, divided by the one year earlier number, and you get a first derivative, a rate of change that tells you uh, where you are in the business cycle. It helps you find leading indicators. It helps you make decisions as to what will be. And, and using that methodology and the the science of, of uh, our founder, Chapin Hoskins, and his theories, we come up with this. There's a forecast there for you that I want to share. Industrial production is going to continue to ascend in 2010 through the rest of the year, 11 and 12. That's what this graph shows you. The forecast is the dotted white line on the right-hand side of the screen. Now, you can see we got the recession right in terms of the dynamics, the trough, the rate of recovery out the other side. Those of you that know ITR well know that we've dampened our outlook for 11 compared to where we were a year ago. 
members of Vistage, ACG, and others that I've had the privilege of meeting, I, I, I understand that, that's a change. It's still a recovery from what I told you a year ago, but it is a milder rate of rise in 11 than what we were talking about a year ago, and we did warn about the danger of that. The U.S. economy is not going to be up to the May 2008 peak for years to come. Moving upward is recovery. Moving above that May 2008 peak is growth. The reason I'm stopping on this point is because if anybody in this room it really needs to have 2007 and 8 come back again. I mean, they need that level of activity to be happy and to be prosperous and for their businesses and enterprises to do well. You're going to be waiting six years for that to happen. We have to make sure that we have all adjusted to the new reality that what we have now is what we should be profitable doing. That this level of activity is a good baseline and in 11 and 12 is going to move up some, but that's not a dramatic rise. And while I wasn't tasked with going further out, I'd be happy to tell you, in case I get hit by the proverbial bus, that in ITR world, my world, 2013 is a flat year, and 2014 is another mild recession, a little interruption in the recovery trend. And that you're not really going to like business activity until 15 and 16. So that's the lay of the land. Let's talk about the things that are on the left there inside of the screen, because those are the problems. Those are things we must face. And, and you know, one of the things that drives me nuts is when I hear people say that banks are evil and that bankers are the cause of everything that happened. There are some banks that did things wrong and there are some banks that didn't do what they were supposed to do. But bankers overall are not evil people. They are in business to make money. This graph is to show us a pretty straight up application. When you look at what's happening in 1990, there was a small recession, bankers lent less. Early 2000s, there was a bigger recession, bankers lent less. They get to the Great Recession and they cut really back on their lending. Who wouldn't? Recovery is, is where you lend more. In a recession, you cut back because the risks are really low, are really a high, and the reward is really low. Interest rates are at record levels. Why would you lend? when you have a great chance that you're going to be defaulted upon. You'd have to be simple to think that you should lend more into a recession. But isn't that exactly what we are hearing as a rallying cry out of Washington? Why aren't they lending more? The answer is because they want to stay in business. How many people in this room decided to do away with credit requirements and just gave anybody that walked in the door whatever it is they wanted and hope that they paid you back? Could you, could you raise your hand so we could compliment you on your skills? Why would we expect a bank to do anything differently? Now you look at this rate of change, that yellow line moving up, and then you should be smiling when you look at that, because that means that banks are lending more. And when we look at delinquency rates, they're coming down rather sharply and nicely. We look at consumer delinquency, and it is coming down from record high levels. We have a nice decline going on in consumer delinquency, and consumer demand, to Julie's point, is increasing. So more consumers are demanding credit, more businesses are finding credit, and that means that you have a sustainable recovery on your hands. The banking industry is doing what the banking industry should do. They're doing it cautiously, given all the uncertainty that they're facing over new regulations, who they'll be answering to, what's going to be required of them, the fact that they have way too much commercial real estate, and yet they're still turning the corner, and we will find a sustainable recovery because of it. It's, it's a great graph. One of the dangers we have to face is recession, uh, is, excuse me, inflation. Not this year. But about four quarters from now, we're going to find energy prices heating up. We're going to find copper heating up again, zinc, metals of all kinds. This is a fantastic time to be planning on getting into commodities in about six months, in my opinion. And as that inflation comes, it's going to find its way into wages because we care about people. Not because there are, there's a low unemployment number. We're going to have plenty of people. The question is, we want to have people have a lower standard of living. See, if people working for us have a lower standard of living, they come to work unhappy. If they come to work unhappy, they're not very productive, and they treat our clients miserably, and our profits will be going down. So if you want to see your profits improve in the future, despite the fact that you don't have to, when there's inflation coming, we're going to hand out raises to people or else we will be suffering through an unhappy workforce. Can I give you a quick story? And I promise to make it really quick, because I only have 20 minutes anyway. It was, it was when inflation was spiking a couple of years ago. There, there was a great deal of increase in energy prices, food prices. A young lady came up to me. She was absolutely miserable. I could see it on her face. And she said, look it, 
my life's falling apart. I need to talk to you. I need, I need to know what's going on. So I said, tell me. And she said, I can't pay my bills anymore. And my phone rings. I'm afraid it's a debt collector. I've had some medical problems, and my insurance isn't covering it all. And I used to save, and I can't save. And I, and I work 60 hours a week, and I still, I'm so stressed, I can't deal with it. I said, did you, did you lose a job? She said, no, 60 hours a week. I said, did you get a raise lately? She said, I haven't had a raise in over a year. And she's angry, bitter. And I said, well, the problem is it's inflation. Inflation's come and stole your standard of living. And in three minutes, I diagnosed the problem and offered no help whatsoever, fulfilling my role as an economist. That's what we do. <laughs> we know exactly what's wrong. Have fun with that. She looked at me right in the eyes, right in the eyes, and she said, but dad, what am I going to do? <laughs> That's a tough one. Now it's personal. By the way, I've been doing, I did, as an aside, what I've been doing successfully for all my uh, life as a parent. I said, I don't know, go ask your mother. <laughs> my wife solved the problem. How did she solve the problem? Gave her a check. <laughs> Absolutely right. That month, and the month after, and the month after, and the month after. Rule one of bailouts. Once you start a bailout, they're very hard to stop. <laughs> they become very dependent upon that bailout. Inflation means that you and I are going to have to raise prices. Inflation that's coming in a year means that you and I are going to have to drive efficiencies into our business. You and I are going to have to make capital expenditures which will make us more efficient. You and I are going to have to do the things that will increase our efficiency in ordering, in sales, in management, in safety. We're going to have to spend money to do that because if we don't, inflation is going to steal our profits. And in a year, we're all going to have to be raising prices. And we have to get our minds wrapped around that. And it's going to last for a while. As we look at in the cost of money, it shows us that we've lived through a long disinflation and deflationary time period. This has been going on for 25 years. This is why people got interest rate only mortgages and didn't think there was a problem. The real estate only goes up. Interest rates only go down. Why shouldn't I get 100% financing with an interest rate only adjustable rate mortgage? And, and of course, in their minds, it was perfectly logical. One of my children did that. And I said, don't do that. Interest rates always go the other way. And property values are going to sink. And I got these solid, oh, dad, which is just code for you're an old fossil. You don't understand anymore how it all works. But you and I know how it works, don't we? This is the left-hand side of a bowl and is the right-hand side of the bowl. And those kids sitting over there are going to spend the next 20, 25 years living in a world where there's moderate to, to eventually severe inflation. They're going to live in a world where interest rates only go up. You and I are going to be running our businesses in an inflation world with higher interest rates where the last 20 to 25 years, all we've had is disinflation and lower interest rates. And you and I don't know how to do that because we weren't alive. Well, we were alive, but we weren't running our businesses the last time we had to go through this. So we're going to have to rethink our operations from people management to inventory management to pricing to positioning to marketing. It all changes as we begin to run up the right-hand side of the bowl. And we end up in the Carter years, those peak years, in about 20, 25 years. Here's a problem that just won't go away. The budget deficit. We're going to be short a trillion dollars a year, according to the Office of Management and Budget. We're going to be looking at a debt to GDP of 90% in 20 years. And the decade after this, we're going to see the budget deficit go to two $2 trillion a year, they say. Totally unsustainable. I don't think anybody would disagree with that. What you and I have to realize, though, is that the spending that has gone in the past must be paid for now because the demographics are demanding that it be paid for now. The sovereign debt issues of the world are certainly going to contribute to difficulties down the road, but the sovereign debt issues of the United States are going to lead the way. We will look like those pig nations in 10 years, while Germany, France, the UK, Australia, and Canada are balancing their budgets, reducing their sovereign debt. The United States is heading in the wrong direction. That means downward pressure on the dollar. It means inflation, and it means higher interest rates as we go down the road, and it means higher taxes. Well, if I were emperor, I would not raise taxes to solve the problem. We can probably count on Congress doing exactly that. So we have to plan on the triple threat, higher taxes, inflation, higher interest rates, and manage our businesses effectively in that environment. And just so that everybody knows, and especially thinking of the kids that are going to be paying for this for the rest of their lives, a trillion dollars is no little thing. 
I asked my wife what a trillion dollars was. She said, wait a minute, we do real estate together. She's a teacher, she's a smart lady. She said 12 zeros. I said, put it in context for me. And she said, I can't. I said, this is a trillion dollars, dear. I said, if I could give you a million dollars a day to spend, one million dollars a day, it would take you 2,740 years to reach one trillion. You just don't pay it back quickly. She said, I'm sure I could spend it in less. I know I could, just give me a chance, but <laughs> different conversation. There is good news going on as we wrap up. The world is in recovery. That global expansion is certainly good news. It means there'll be export opportunities, be jobs created. A weakening dollar will help the exports. It means that we're not going to collapse. The dollar is not facing a collapse, just downward pressure. There's a world of opportunity going on out there. As we look at corporate profits, we have right-sized in America. That's exceptionally good news. And the increased profits mean that we're not going to face a double dip. We will be able to pay some taxes that the economy continues forward. And my personal favorite graph is the fact that household net worth is where it should be. Household net worth is, is at the long-term average from the 80s and 90s and even the 50s and 60s. We went through two great bubbles. We felt great. We felt like we could retire at 50 and life was perfect and how easy this was. That's just a bubble mentality. Now that we're back to normal, we'll go back to normal spending, normal growth, normal appreciation in prices, and life will go on. Now when it comes to leading indicators, you should be watching the Institute for Supply Management's uh, PMI, Purchasing Managers Index. We should be watching the U.S. leading indicator, which is signaling ongoing economic recovery. Fantastic leading indicator by the conference board. And you should be watching the financial markets. You look at what's happening in corporate bond prices, that 12-12 rate of change is rising. And, and while this is inherently a beautiful graph, and you're probably wondering how you could get a copy framed and signed and put under a special light in your office, it speaks to your soul, I'm sure, especially if you have a musical background. It's simply saying the economy is going to continue to expand because that yellow line has to be moving downward if we're going to collapse, if we're going to move into recession. And the fact is that we have that little scoop, which is that softer move in 11, but we're going to see continued expansion. When I look at retail sales, I get positively euphoric. We have reduced debt as consumers. We are paying off our credit cards. We have some forced deleveraging going on. We're saving at a $662 billion annual rate, and we're spending more. This is deflated. I've eliminated the effect of inflation. And we're spending above year ago levels. The trends are positive as the consumer is doing the right thing, saving, deleveraging. We're still spending. And as we are spending, the economy will expand. And as the economy expands, it means that housing will hold its own. That bottom blue line will be flat. It's not going to collapse because of a shadow inventory. There are balancing factors. There are cultural events. There's more than we can discuss in a 20-minute time period. But as housing levels off and stays level, the economy won't collapse. The consumer's doing the right thing. Businesses are doing the right thing. The government is, is eventually going to do the right thing. The question then comes down to what are we going to do? In a, in a world of uncertainty, and that's what we're living in, it comes down to the individual again. What decisions are we going to make? What are we going to do that's going to change the future? We could sit and wait for government to make everything all better. It could be because of where I live, but I categorically, categorically reject that mindset. I live in New Hampshire. You know what it says on our license plates in New Hampshire, right? Live free or die. Absolutely right. Which, by the way, as an aside, our license plates are made by state prisoners, which is really a strange concept when you think about it, but it's a funny little state. On our radio show, my brother and I were interviewing, and I'm going to end with this, a gentleman named Bill Stockwell, who's a manufacturer in Philadelphia. And Bill just added 10% more people to his workforce. I said, Bill, how can you do that? You don't know what health care reform is going to do. You have no idea what, what the, the pressures that you're going to face from, from new regulations next year. In this great uncertainty, how are you doing that? And Bill's answer was, was straight up. Bill said, because this is about me. This is about my business, and I will drive my business forward. I'm not going to let them tell me what to do. That's the attitude that we all have to have. It is the decision that we will each make about our businesses, knowing the pressures that we're going to face. Thank you very much for your time. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you.